Welcome, everyone. It's great to see everyone here tonight. Um, I'm Carmen Rios. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a feminist writer, broadcaster, and community builder, as well as AEOO's digital director. Um, and I'm excited to be moderating tonight's conversation on private equity. Um, I'm going to drop some links about me in the chat so that we can skip right to hearing from our very esteemed guests um, instead of hearing all about me. And so I also want to give us the chance to get a little warmed up and to have you tell us a little bit about yourselves, too. So go ahead and warm up that chat. Tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, you know, tell us why you're excited to be here. Um, and I also... Before we start the conversation, while you all are introducing yourselves, want to just give a little bit of an overview of the intentions, the assumptions, and the intentions that we bring into these spaces. Um, so we enter into these conversations um, here at an economy of our own with the assumptions that money talks in a male voice, that none of our present systems, rules, or tools were invented by women when it comes to finance, that a privileged male discourse has omitted, misnamed, and discounted women's production, passionate attention, and ideas. We enter into the conversation with the assumption that while slavery ended in the US only 156 years ago, which might be, that number might be 157 now, systemic racial exploitation remains in place, that women have always worked, but only in the past 50 years have a majority of women and young mothers entered the modern economy's job market, that women and people of color have hurdled educational and legal barriers, newly becoming financial banking and investment managers, business owners, policymakers, yet we know that women's work and caring remains discounted, that economics from the Greek word Oikonomia literally means household management, a realm that every woman knows, and that means that we can change an economy waged as war to one that wages life. We also come into these spaces with the assumption that growing inequality and environmental destruction tell us we cannot afford more alpha male only business as usual. Um, this is also the first in a series of conversations this year in which we want to sort of take the want to expose financialization and the ways in which uh, financialization is impacting our economy and our everyday lives. Um, so this is a very strong starting place for that, but that is also an assumption that we're bringing to this conversation. And in terms of our intent, we trust that each woman's identity will be shaped and strengthened by the discovery of her own economic truth. We honor all stages in women's way of knowing through silence, by being quiet, seen, but not heard, feeling dumb and disconnected and transforming that by receiving knowledge. We do this by listening to the voices of others, often those who are in authority. Um, we then receive subjective knowledge. We listen to our own inner voice and protect it. Um, then we receive procedural knowledge. We separate and connect different ways of knowing. Um, and we ask questions and find some truths that are more reliable and logical than others. And this is where we build our constructed knowledge. We recognize that all knowledge is built, not born. We trust our ability to pursue knowledge by listening to diverse voices, considering complex context, and collaborating while communicating our thoughts and our questions. We believe that we can hold and remodel our ideas with passion and pleasure. And with that, um, I am excited to get to it and to welcome Alia Sarbawal with Americans for Financial Reform and Jess Newman with United for Respect. Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I am going to drop as our conversation begins our resources for further learning in the chat. We're going to email these out to you all as well. Uh, often we try to send these out beforehand, um, but we've been working on this curriculum for you up until the moment. So these are some resources for further learning, but there's also some vocabulary, um, sort of essential terms in there that might come up. So it might be handy reference as we move forward. Uh, and while we give Alia and Jess a chance to introduce themselves, go ahead and let us know on a scale of zero to 10, where you all grade yourselves on the knowledge of private equity um, in the chat expecting a lot of numbers below five, but that might just be me. Um, so, okay, let's get it 
started um ooh, oh t- some ones and a six i'm truly blown away i am very impressed pamela um marcy thank you for keeping it real a zero is uh a needed oh four to five okay grading ourselves on a scale um Okay, so we have a range here of people who are familiar with the issue, um, and I think that's great because we'll be starting with the basics and then digging in some really good questions. Um, all right, so here at AEOO, we believe that the personal is political, but also economic. So we invite our guests to tell us their own personal stories by way of an introduction of how they came to know and care about these issues. Um, so. Alia, why don't you get us started uh, and tell us a little bit about how you found your passion for private equity um, and the work that you're doing at AFR. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really glad to be here with all of you. Uh, Alia Suberwell, she, her pronouns. Um, I am currently a private equity campaign manager at Americans for Financial Reform. Um, so I work with a a wide range of partners uh, across the advocacy movement. So. Folks like Jess Newman, uh, who I work with very closely, we co-run a private equity coalition together um, that is all about bringing together different campaigners and experts on the industry to figure out the strategies to best uh, push back on their growing influence on our economy. And, um, you know, I my passion for private equity, which is interesting way to put it, because, you know, it wasn't really on my radar and I kind of... I think uh, along with a lot of people who kind of stumble into their, you know, experiences, professional experiences or lived experience, you know, you kind of learn about it at a point when you're interacting with it. So um, I will say that this is a very technical topic and and there are many ways to talk about Wall Street and Wall Street accountability, which is the world that Jess and I are in, just to be clear, we are not pro private equity, <laughs> um, but um you know, I uh, before coming to Americans for Financial Reform, I was an organizer at United for Respect, which is where Jess is currently. And um, I was uh, brought on to a new team to kind of uh, start organizing laid off workers, retail workers, whose companies had been bought over by private equity companies and then driven into bankruptcy. And so the first uh, campaign that I worked on was Toys R Us, which went bankrupt in uh, 2018. They declared bankruptcy in 2017. Um, 33,000 workers lost their jobs. And I was uh, at the very beginning stages of of starting my job at United for Respect. Every day I was uh, talking to workers over the phone, um, over text, asking them questions about how they were holding up uh, while they were going through this crisis. And um, I think the the stories of everyday people who are like experiencing financialization in these very concrete terms of I don't have a job, I don't know where, uh, how I'm going to pay my bills, I have huge, you know, I have outstanding medical debt, I have, you know, all the sort of concrete, like very real tangible things that people are, are grappling with and, and dealing with, um, hearing that surface. Uh, that was a really important part of like what drove my interest in understanding the inner workings of this industry. The other part though, is that people are not only just interested in the, you know, in talking about their medical bills. And I mean, that was a very important part of course, but they were also kind of grappling with the bigger questions as well of like, how did we get here? How did I, somebody who worked really hard their whole lives um, get to this point where I'm out of a job in my 60s after having put in decades of work in this industry? How am I, you know, a woman who has been working in this industry and, you know, raised my family um, off of my job in retail, um, that I've watched the the retail sector change over time, what am I going to do next? And, you know, the bigger questions of like, how could this happen, right? How could a, a nationally renowned toy company um, go bankrupt? Like, what is at play? What is happening? So um, those big questions and the concrete, like, realities of what financialization, you know, looks like in people's lives, um, having the opportunity to actually collect those stories, that's what drove my interest to continue to learn about the industry and which is what brought me to um, Americans for Financial Reform we're a national nonprofit. We do a lot of uh, policy and advocacy work 
a lot of regulatory work and we have um, a wonderful team of, of policy experts um, that work across a ton of different financial reform issues. We have a team of campaigners and coalition managers. Uh, I'm one of them who work with all of our partners, unions, internationals and locals, uh, grassroots partners, researchers, other policy organizations, national, local groups uh, all across the board. Uh, we have wonderful researchers putting out research on um, all of them, you know, a lot of it is on private equity, but the, our research team kind of does, you, you know, um, new research on, on all of the various topics our, our uh, organization works on. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about how I got to this topic and how I got interested in this issue. Thank you so much for sharing um, and for the work that you do. Um, and Jess, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your story, your journey to this work and the work that you're doing with United for Respect. Sure. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Jess Newman. She, her pronouns. I am the Dep Deputy Director of Policy and Politics uh, here at United for Respect, um, which is a fancy way of saying that um, I oversee a portfolio of issues, including private equity, um, but also broader economic justice issues on behalf of the 5 million retail workers um, in this country. Um, United for Respect primarily focuses on organizing um, workers at Amazon and Walmart, which are the largest uh, private employers in the country. And our hope is that by raising the floor for these workers, we can raise the floor for everybody. Um, so I, I similarly, you know, passion, passion for the subject of private equity um, is a passion for people's lives and improving them, right? Um, and seeing how these companies have swooped in, um, taken over industry by industry, um, multiple as aspects of our lives. I think there isn't an aspect of any of our lives that isn't somehow touched by a private equity firm and just um, massively degrading not only the quality of products and services, but quality of life for people across this country. Um, and it's funny, you know, I've spent my entire career, you know, in labor organizing, political organizing. Um, I'm a, a non-practicing lawyer. Um, and I still could not tell you, I would not call myself an expert on private equity. So none of you, I mean, I, should, I shouldn't say that on this call, but I say that to say it is a beast. Um, and so you shouldn't feel badly if you're coming in with a lot of knowledge. I've been working on this um, similarly to Alia. Uh, since I got here, um, which is almost four years ago, um, and there's always something new to learn because the industry itself is so nimble. Um, they have, uh, you know, the, the way that United for Respect came into this work, um, as Alia mentioned, is because they were expanding into retail. Um, and, you know, they bought up multiple major brand name retailers. Toys R Us was mentioned. Um, Sears was a hedge fund takeover, but it's a similar um, model of, um, you know, buying these name brand businesses and then stripping them for parts. Um, and then, you know, making... Uh, taking all of the sucking out all of the profit and then um, summarily un dismissing all of their workers um, without any kind of cushion, health care, et cetera. Um, and I think um, what really deeply um, ingrained this to me, and I should say I first started working on this several years ago when I was at the Communications Workers Union, when we were trying to build a political education program, trying to talk to people about this. Um, union workers, how do you tell people um, about financial regulations without their eyes glazing over? That was sort of my first, <laughs> that was my first um, foray into this. But I think what really drove it home for me um, was when I started um, my position here as, um, you know, my one of my first positions here at United for Respect several years ago, um, I live in Michigan, I should say, I'm based outside Detroit. Um, one of the main retailers that we um, organized workers at was a furniture store called Art Van, um, which Alia knows very well. She also worked very closely with these folks. Um, as a Michigander, Art Van Furniture um, is a, a big name. Um, they uh, um, Used to they give out mil or used to give out millions of dollars in charity every year. Um, they sponsored our local Thanksgiving Day parade. Um, my couch is from Art Van. <laughs> um, you know, you would be hard pressed to find a Michigander that doesn't um, have some piece of furniture or have it have had it touch their life. Um, and you know, it's it was you know dominated the airways with their um, commercials. I'm sure you all know some kind of similar furniture retailer, family owned. Um, now, the thing about Art Van is that the folks that worked there worked there for decades, right? They built careers there, just like they did at Toys R Us. I think a lot of people think of these retail jobs as jobs for teens that are very um, high turnover, right? But these people built 
careers. They planned to retire from this company. Um, you know, I think the average length of, of their tenure when um, they were all laid off was about, you know, 15, 10 to 15 years. Um, and when I started it was actually um, maybe two or three months into the pandemic. Um, and this was just after uh, these folks were laid off. So a private equity firm called TH Lee came in, took over this company, convinced the family, which is a very um, common story, that they were going to steward the ship well, make sure they increase their profitability. Um, they love to, these private equity firms love to call themselves turnaround artists, when in reality, they sold off all of their most lucrative lines, um, laid off all of the people who had the knowledge of bringing in the right product and had the relationships, um, over leveraged themselves, which is a word you'll hear us use, um, you know, very leveraged buyouts, um, meaning that they borrowed a lot of debt that they never planned to take back, uh, pay back. Um, to acquire the company. Um, and they uh, slowly degraded the company to the point where they had to declare bankruptcy. Um, now, when they declared bankruptcy was March of 2019. Um, and we all know what that date was, right? And so we're talking about thousands of people who, again, had spent their entire lives working at this retailer, who overnight were told, um, we're closing in a week, you don't have a job anymore, and we are shutting off your health insurance um, and all of your uh, access to your benefits. Oh, and by the way, you have to work this last week in the middle of a pandemic that nobody understood the ramifications of. And we're talking about thousands of dollars worth of merchandise that people have purchased, and they have absolutely no idea how they're going to get it, right? So we're talking about people showing up with guns, um, you know, screaming in people's faces, trying to know, figure out where their furniture was, you know, I um, uh, couldn't get in touch with anyone. They turned off the phone lines um, at the headquarters. And then all of these folks were out without a job or health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so that's really where my passion for taking on private equity comes from. I know I said I need to reframe it because I, I am not passionate about the, well, I will call them vultures. I will be so bold. Um, but I'm passionate about the people who were affected. And so, um, you know, I continue to take that spirit with me. I work with a lot of these folks still. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing here in Michigan around some legislation. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I will stop babbling now. But that is that is a little bit about me and sort of how I came to this work with Alia. My God, never, never stop. Um, I'm not going to mute you, Jess, ever. All right. And so you two have both talked a little bit about how you came to know each other and the fact that, you know, AFR and United for Respect are doing a lot of work together. Uh, I'm curious, you know, there's obviously with anything like this, there has to be multiple sort of lines of attack, right? If we're passionate about taking on private equity, um, not passionate about private equity itself. Uh, and so I'm curious if you all can just speak a little more about how your two organizations are different and how they're approaching, you know, making sure that we don't live in an economy where, you know, a hedge fund or a very rich person or a corporation can swoop in and just dismantle, you know, your economic security this way. Yeah, I'll start. Um, you know, I think AFR um, is, you know, like I said, we have a very robust like policy um, staff and, you know, the, the mission of the organization is really to use all of the regulatory and legislative like levers that we have available to us to build a fairer economy. So I think building a fairer economy is what connects United for Respect's work and what and AFR's work. Uh, but a lot of our work delves uh, oftentimes very into the nitty gritty, the technical pieces of uh, the financial system, um, whether it's things like, um, you know, commenting on, um, you know, regulatory rules that are being um, set out by uh, agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, where last year they issued new rules around um, what kinds of disclosures, what kinds of information needs to be provided by um, private equity fund managers to their investors. Uh, I believe there's somebody here uh, who actually works for uh, Union Pension Fund. Did I read that right? And so uh, institutional investors that include things like, you know, pensions of, uh, you know, union members and public employees. They are one of the largest institutional investors in, uh, in private equity funds. 
um, university endowments. And uh, so there were, there was a big push by the SEC to create more transparency. And, um, you know, we were very involved. My colleague was very involved in making recommendations and issuing rules, getting our partners to support rules, supporting, you know, uh, sign on letters and things like that uh, to get the strongest rules possible. Um, so that's a little bit of like some of the policy side of the work that we, we do um, that I think is a little different from how United for Respect does its work. Yeah, thank you, Alia. So um, I would say, you know, we support a lot of the comments on regulations and um, are kept abreast of uh, lobbying efforts, briefings, et cetera. But really where uh, we come into play is organizing the workers who've been affected by the industry and bringing the worker voice to the story. Um, you know, all of the work, we, I like to call AFR our wonks um, and we're their worker counterparts. <laughs> um, so if I ever have a question about something technical, I will email my friends at AFR and ask them to explain it to me. Um, but what we do is we try to make sure that folks like Shirley, um, who um, I work with on the Art Van campaign, Bruce, who I work with on the Sears campaign, um, you know, these folks who have been affected um, on the ground um, have an ability to explain what happened to them, um, what it looks like on the shop floor when a private equity firm takes over their company. Because I think, you know, the average person does not understand what these firms are or what they do. Um, but when somebody who's lived through, um, you know, really the horror of a private equity taking over um, their their company and their workplace, um, where they don't know who their boss is, or it changes every five minutes, um, what they thought were the um, uh, the products that they carried were no longer the products they carried, that would change. You know, seeing the quality of service slowly degrade um, to the point that they then all were at risk of losing their jobs and then subsequently did. Um, that is what we do. So um, we bro bring folks with us to the Hill, whether that's virtual lobby meetings or actual, you know, lobby days um, in D.C. Um, here in Michigan, you know, we take them to the State House in Lansing. Um, but we want our, our decision makers to have conversations with the people who are directly impacted and affected by this, because it humanizes this in a way um, that, that makes the whole issue really sink in more deeply. Um, you know, legislators are people you know, I think we forget that just like us, a lot of them do not have this subject matter expertise. And so when you bring somebody in that can break it down and say, you know, I lost my house because I'm, I was living in a private equity owned manufactured house. Um, and I did not have any idea who owned my home and they were able to raise the, um, you know, fees through the roof, didn't have, were unresponsive when I had issues, et cetera, right? Um, that really makes the issue sink more deeply and it's something that they pay attention to um, more. So um, we're we're the worker voice to our, our counterparts, the wonks at AFR, who are lovely, wonderful people. <laughs> well, and I think that that is a perfect opportunity for us to uh, get a little wonky and talk a little bit about language. And I'm actually going to pass it to you first, Jess, uh, because... United for Respect has renamed private equity pirate equity. So I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit on, you know, what about private equity should remind us of this, you know, caricatured image that we have in our heads of pirates? And what is it really when we talk about private equity and what a, you know, um, a private equity firm is doing and what a leveraged buyout is, you know, what are some of the plain language ways to explain sort of the landscape that we're talking about? And Alia, sure. obviously, please jump in as needed. Yeah, so little known fact, all private equity managers um, greet each other with our matey. No, I'm kidding. Uh <laughs> So uh, the reason we called it pirate equity is because of the plundering, the looting, right? So you'll hear maybe a little bit later about the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, right? Um, but we really wanted to illustrate just what these companies do. I think I mentioned um, in my initial remarks, um, they call themselves turnaround artists when what they really do, um, I would think them think of the big sucking sound. If folks are remember, um, what is that big sucking sound? It's, it's you know, they're taking the money out of your pockets, right? Um, so <laughs> I really debated whether or not to say they all wear eye patches or say eye matey. So I hope you all <laughs> appreciated that joke. Um, but, you know, they employ tactics that everyday people do not have the ability to do, right? They're all rich themselves. 
and they all have a bunch of rich friends. Um, when they say leveraged buyout, what does that mean? That means that they ask their rich friends to give them a bunch of money, um, you know, at very favorable rates to them. So where I might take out, where I might buy something on, on loan on a credit card and I have to pay 21% interest, uh, you know, they're taking out loans with much lower interest rates that they're not even actually responsible for, right? So they've created a situation where it's completely legal for them to take out this money to buy these businesses. So they're not even using their own money to purchase the business that they're buying, the debt they're taking on is not even debt that they are responsible for paying back. And they go in and they, like I said, um, change uh, business practices essentially just to make sure that they can squeeze every single dollar out of these companies that they can. In the case of retail um, and in brick and mortar businesses, they'll sell off the brick and mortars, right? They'll sell off the real estate. Um, the literal storefronts, because that's where a lot of the money is. They will make the business they acquired, pay them a fee for managing the company um, and suck a bunch of money that way. The other piece of this is that we don't even, they don't even know how much money in fees they're spending. That's not transparent at all. Um, they don't even know who owns them half the time. That's that's something that's changing now. Um, we've been successful in advocating around nursing home ownership, um, trying to just get a little bit more disclosure. And it gets really wonky here because it's literally just about filling out a form, right? It's about the financial disclosure forms, adding a line to that form to say, you have to say who owns this so that people can hold you responsible when you are understaffing and hurting and harming people and, are, and people in nursing homes, right? Um, so... They're, they are the opposite of turnaround artists. Um, you know, there's many other things that they do. I think um, um, there was a, an article shared about the carried interest loophole. That's just one example of the many tax laws that they've written into the books that they take advantage of um, to safe harbor their own money um, and still accumulate a ton of wealth at the expense of their workers, um, and oftentimes, actually, also uh, the individuals who they they acquired the money from or acquired the businesses from. So I mentioned the Art Van. Um, the Art Van family actually had to buy their name back because they were so embarrassed by what the um, private equity firm did. They were lied to. Yeah, they they actually had a, quite a lot of um, uh, goodwill that they built up with the company in their name, um, and they sued them. Um, over the right to the to get their name back because of all of the harm that this company did, this um, private equity firm did. So um, we call it pirate equity because I think it really does get at that looting and plundering, um, which is really just the basis of this business. It is not remotely because they want to actually help people or improve, um, you know, the functioning of any of the industries that they operate in. Yeah, and I, I agree with all of that. And I'll just add that it becomes also quite frightening to think of, you know, these plunderers and looters when you're talking about really important key sectors of our economy, like healthcare, like Jess was mentioning, like housing. So if your model, like for thinking about how is private equity operating, what is its mindset? Um you know, just to reiterate the point that everything is an asset and we're going to squeeze it for everything it's worth. So, all right, in a retail store, you have like, all right, let's streamline the staffing, let's streamline, you know, uh, let's create like credit cards that, you know, we have to sell and get the store uh, employees to push like high interest credit cards and pass on debt to customers. That was a pressure point for a lot that a lot of Toys R Us and Art Band workers uh, talked about. Um, you know, selling the real estate, as mentioned, cutting time, like choosing all sorts of like making these decisions with vendors, like, you know, kind of ruining relationships with certain vendors, going with other vendors. And in retail, the vendor relationship is a really important part of how you run the business. And so there were all these nonsensical kind of relationship, like uh, decisions being made around that, that, that workers recognized. Um, so that's like in retail, but when you then look at a hospital and you say, okay, you're an asset and my job is to figure out where I can like get money and, and squeeze every dollar out. Then you're talking about, you know, higher rates of surprise medical billing. So patients coming in and, you know, getting a service, paying for that service and then coming home and, and finding a bill waiting for them that they were not expecting to pay. Um, you're talking again, a similar thing, staffing, uh, staffing ratios, cutting those. 
Um, you're talking about, you know, uh, emergency, or you're talking about doctors, whether it's in emergency rooms, or they're talking about in hospitals, whether you're talking about in nursing homes, um, you know, being staffed, like fewer doctors, fewer nurses, um, having to go through, see more patients, feeling more pressure to, you know, see, uh, treat more patients, um, cutting their, uh, their sort of treatment plans with a consideration for what is the low cost benefit of, you know, trying to find the cheaper alternatives. All of these, you know, that's what happens in healthcare. So like when you have that mindset of like everything is an asset and I'm going to squeeze out every, every dollar, it leads to very scary outcomes, right? So in healthcare, it literally means people are dying at higher rates at private equity owned hospitals and nursing homes. Um, and they are entering childcare, uh, buying out daycares. So like the, it's very, you know, it, it's a very serious thing. I mean, and when you talk about housing, um, treating uh, housing not as uh, a human right, but again, as an asset, squeezing everything out that you possibly can, it means long-term tenants are getting massive uh, rent hikes, um, getting uh, penalized and evicted with no notice. Um, new forms of surveillance that, again, are like, you know, in place to kind of dissuade people from continuing to live there. Um, hidden fees, hidden, you know, in, in utilities bills, overcharging on utilities, all of these types of things. So, again, I mean, scary outcomes when you really think about, you know, when you're entering in uh, sectors that, I mean, everybody is going to be interacting with healthcare. Everybody is going to be attracted as a tenant or a homeowner or an attempted owner, homeowner at some point, right? Um and so I think that indiscriminate sort of attempts to sort of squeeze every last dollar out of uh, whether it's, you know, patients or tenants or, or workers, um, that I think also, I think the pirate analogy kind of uh, fits there as well. I, I just would add one more thing that I think oh, pirate equity label sort of really helpfully illustrates to me, you know, how pirates, they, they have their target, they acquire their loot and they move on. Um, private equity operates in a very similar way. Um, so, you know, I, they we, we're talking about retail. They've actually sort of disinvested in retail in the last several years because they found more new lucrative industries that they're about to go loot and plunder. Um, and once they've squeezed every dollar out of those, they will move on. So I just wanted to sort of underscore that point too. No, that's so important. And, you know, and it is obviously very scary to think that this could happen to our healthcare system, which I mean, is already pretty degraded. And, you know, to us as renters, as homeowners. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, when we think about the dangers of private equity, we see these, you know, we see that Toys R Us didn't exist anymore. We, you know, we see that our van doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I feel like I'm not the only one who in the past couple of years has sort of been like, where are the businesses? You know, why is the only place left that I can buy furniture either is somewhere that's, you know, extremely high end or amazon.com. And it's clear that it's because a lot of these companies are being run to ruin, right, by these private equity firms. So I'm curious, like, what are the reverberations of what happens? You know, we know the ways that you guys have done a great job of talking about how it affects the workers, how it affects, um, did we lose Jess or did Jess just get unpinned? Um, we lost Jess, I think. <laughs> Well, Leah, I'm going to have to bump this one to you till she gets back in. <laughs> but yeah, really what fun. are some of those broader effects that it's been having on, on our economy, on workers in other sectors or at other chains? You know, what what is that sort of domino effect that we've seen that yeah. private equity has had? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this question of like, what is so dangerous about the industry? Um, oh, let me just see. I think Jess... Oh no, Jess's power just went out. She just texted me. So, okay. Um, well, I will uh, definitely cover for Jess, um, but that's what happened. Um, okay. So Jess, well, all of our solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will miss Jess. Hopefully uh, she'll be able to uh, come back. Um, let me just say that hopefully, yeah, can join again. Um, but if not, we'll carry on the conversation and any questions folks have specifically for Jess, you know, we'll be happy to, you know, connect you to her. Um, okay. So, um, what was I saying? Yes. So one of the, you know, 
dangers of the industry is is you know what we were talking about at the end of the the last question the sort of indiscriminate sort of looking for new sources of profit looking for new sources of capital and so one of the things that i think of as the sort of scary trend that we see and dangerous trend that we see is that they are very their ability to adapt to changing market conditions and their ability to have like a number of different strategies that they use um that is really ultimately about growing their influence, growing their power. That's really scary. And that as a campaigner, um, it, it makes it obviously harder for us to kind of keep up and keep track of what are the tools and tactics they're using. Um, as you know, when when I joined United for Respect, the you know, we built out a Wall Street accountability uh, program at United for Respect. And then the industry moved on, as Jess just mentioned. So, you know, does it make sense for an organization like United for Respect to still be organizing around private equity when there are just fewer retail companies that are following that same model that happened to Toys R Us, um, Artvan, uh, Kmart, you know, a whole bunch that we were actually in the throat, you know, we were sort of in the midst of organizing. So it is hard to sometimes keep track of that. Um, Okay, good news is that her lights are back, uh, but she is waiting to reconnect to the internet. So hopefully we will have Jess join us. Um, and I still have a couple more things to say anyway. So maybe she'll yeah, join we'll go right for now. it. Yes. yes. Um, and so right now, this year, you know, we're talking about the the context in which the private equity industry um is operating is a it's a high interest uh, you know. Uh, environment, right? Interest rates are super high, and that makes their leverage buyout model, which is sort of reliant on cheap borrowing, um, a lot less lucrative. But that being said, um, the industry is finding new ways to finance their deals and their takeovers. So there is some like super um, obscure, a lot of their operations are very obscure, because like we mentioned earlier, you don't have, there aren't a lot of disclosure requirements for showing who owns what. But there are even more obscure um, private equity entities that are also financing um, private equity arms that are helping finance some of these deals. Um, and then we're finding that the you know private equity firms are going after public money through government programs, through tax breaks. One small example is that um, before I was working at Americans for Financial Reform, I mentioned the private equity coalition. Uh, when I first started my first year and a half, I was uh, running a coalition of government accountability uh, experts. And we were looking at uh, COVID relief programs and looking at uh, guardrails and standards and COVID relief programs. And we found, uh, we really honed in on the Paycheck Protection Program, which um, maybe some of you are familiar with. It was a small business um, loan program um, and grant really uh, for the purposes during for the purposes of the uh, the pandemic, the goal was to you know provide you know quick infusions of cash um, for small businesses uh, to just keep their payroll going. So there were like you know you had to spend a certain um, percentage on on payroll costs so that you could keep paying your employees. That was the purpose of the program, and we found that you know um, private equity firms were receiving some of the money that they were. Oh, Jess is back. Okay. Um, Jess, I was giving people like a blow by blow account of like everything that was happening. So they are all up to speed on when your lights went off and when they came back on. So <laughs> um, what's but, but, Yeah, I know. It's so frustrating that that happened. But I mean, that was just a few minute disruption. So for you, which is yeah, great. grateful that you could hop right back on. Yeah. Um, and so Anyway, yeah, just to say that, like, you know, private equity firms during the pandemic were um, trying to say that they qualified for small business loans because they said they were small businesses. These are like the, you know, these are, um, they hold like trillions of dollars in like liquid cash and they are calling themselves small businesses because of employee threshold numbers and other ways that we used to define small businesses. Um, and, you know, cash was funneled to private equity firms through their portfolio companies. So like Toys R Us, for example, is a portfolio company whose owners are, were, you know, private equity firms, Bain Capital and KKR. So when we talk about portfolio companies, it's really, you know, the property management companies or the retail companies or the grocery stores or whatever that, you know, have private equity backing. Um, so sometimes the money would go to the, you know, the small business, but they have a private equity owner. And so the money really goes to the private equity owner. Um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, those were all of the ways that, you know, we saw they were kind of scheming during the pandemic to kind of loot government programs that were intended for very specific recipients. Um, and so our, uh, the, the COVID oversight coalition that I ran kind of, you know, did an assessment and we met with the White House to talk about these problems with the, with the relief program. So that's just one example. There are other examples of how they, you know, uh, their push into purchasing low-income housing um, which is also driven by, you know, uh, federal tax credits that are available for affordable housing. Of course, other private equity firms um, like Blackstone are literally like the drivers of housing affordability in, in very important, like very big states like California, very, very, you know, uh, where housing is already super unaffordable and they're driving that crisis in, in California, um, but are also, you know, purchasing affordable housing units. Um, as well. So, you know, there, there are those types of um, incentives, federal incentives, tax breaks, government programs, all like a mix of like what we consider public money that they are trying to access. Um, so I think I'll stop there because, yeah, that's most of what I wanted to say. Thank you. No, and I mean, that's a really important point to make too, that it's not just you know, employees at companies that get bought out that are at risk. It's not just about having a certain kind of job that'll keep you safe from this. It's that, you know, it's affecting where our tax money is going and our quality of living of life and the price of our housing. I live in LA. So you'll have to tell me exactly whose door to knock on and yell at um, about the rising rents over here. Um, and then Jess, just to catch you up, I was sort of curious about the reverberations that we see from private equity buyouts and the ruin that they're driving, right? You know, if we if we see that art vans employees are all out of a job and, um, you know, now no one has a place anymore that they can buy furniture that they trust and love, um, you know, what are sort of the, what's the domino effect from there? What have you seen working with folks on the ground about, you know, how private equity impacts people who aren't immediately employed by the business or how it continues to shape the economy after, you know, a company is sort of run into the ground. Yeah. So I think aside from uh, when they acquire, you know, the businesses and um, vital services that we need, like um, hospitals and nursing homes and also, you know, um, private property, um, when a storefront closes, that affects the whole community, right? Mm -hmm. It's beyond, you know, the furniture um, that they can't buy anymore, which is cer certainly something that um, matters to the consumer. Um, this is, you know, a business that no longer is an anchor in a mall. Um, they, you know, oftentimes, and this is, you know, another hat that I wear working on tax loopholes in other ways, they, they oftentimes write in the deed too, um, that you, or the, the terms of the, the agreement that they can't use that property for anything else in perpetuity other than a retail space. Um, so oftentimes these storefronts just lay, are empty. Um, you know, that impacts other businesses that are adjoining them. That's less traffic coming to the mall. Um, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I'll just add, um, oh, is Jess back? Oh, Jess is I'm back. back. I'm not without my, my issues. I don't know what's going on today with my... <laughs> I think private equity is listening in. Yeah. <laughs> Has Zoom recently been acquired? That is a valid question here. Oh, wait, hold on. On you, um, and I'm in. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> There's a bit of a delay, Jess. Okay. I'm, I'm on my phone and I've just reconnected to my Wi-Fi. Everything's shut down um, and it's all coming back online, guys. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that this is TH Lee. Um, <laughs> this is Blackstone and KKR. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I, I was just sort of saying that it, it has those ripple effects in terms of just like, losing an anchor business um and that you know impacts the other businesses around them um impacts impacts the the taxes 
um, that were being paid or, you know, um, the jobs um, that were lost. So, um, you know, I think the human toll really is like the, the, the main thing that we like to emphasize. Um, but we do also talk about the fact that this does cost communities, um, you know, a lot when it comes to not just the tax base, but just a, a vibrant community. Yeah. I'll add one other thing about the sort of investor side, uh, since we've mentioned a little bit about pensions and, you know, what we call institutional investors are, you know, basically not individuals, but like pension, pension boards, pension funds that invest in private equity. Um, we also have some research that says that uh, one of the main reasons why the main incentive for uh, union pensions to be invested in private equity is because they get a good return on the investment and the people running and making decisions about the a union pension, it, you know, they have a, a responsibility, a fiduciary duty to get the best return possible. But there is research that shows that um, this return is overstated because it doesn't account for these fees that Jess was talking about, the fees charged um, and, you know, interest charged and all these other additional sort of hidden charges and fees. And what I mentioned earlier about um, when we were calling about the talking about the private fund rules, the greater disclosures that the SEC was calling for in uh, private equity funds, it was a attempting to address this very fact. Um, so it's really, you know, uh, like there are a lot of challenges. Um, and then, oh, I just, okay, yes, Ricky, thank you for mentioning Kroger and Albertsons. That was literally the next thing I was going to talk about because we just issued a statement today on uh, the FTC, which has sued to block uh, the Albertsons, Kroger Albertsons merger. Um, so yes, for those of you who are familiar with the, these are two of the largest grocery chains in the country, and uh, many of their workers are um, represented by uh, the UFCW, but uh, international well, and locals uh, all across the country, um, United Food and Commercial Workers Union. And, um, you know, as part of the merger, um, you know, uh, Albertsons was going to shut down a bunch of stores, uh, which of course led to a bunch of uh, job losses, but uh, in competing markets. But there was another part of the story that happened pre-merger, which is that Albertsons had um, a private equity firm called Cerber Cerberus that was one of its largest shareholders that orchestrated a special payout, a special dividend, which is a payout made to shareholders in advance of this merger. And this uh, payment was uh, larger. It, was, it accounted for almost more than half of the company's outstanding debt. And, you know, so it's another example of a different kind of looting. It's not looting in the context of a leverage buyout, but it's a looting that's happening in the context of being the largest and most influential shareholder in a, in a grocery chain. So when a grocery chain like Albertsons is then going to be, you know, shut down in order to merge with Kroger, that also produces, a, you know, a lot of issues around, you know, access to, you know, food supply and food deserts. And so the UFCW locals have been talking about, you know, increasing um, prices for consumers, uh, the cost of living that's going to go up as a result of like just not having groceries um, nearby. Um, and, and just like cost of, you know, essentials going up. Um, so yeah, I mean, there there are tons of rippling effects that come out of uh, when a private equity firm, either through a leverage buyout or through other means is shutting down in, um, you know, its operations in a particular location. Um, so yeah, and we can talk industry by industry by industry, you, you know, what that looks like. Thank you both so much. And, you know, Hollis just popped into the chat with a question about, you know, that wouldn't um, regulation be an important fix, an important first step, especially for these government incentives and funding? I think I'm sure we can all agree that, yes, clearly more regulation is needed. Um, and, you know, on our resource doc that I dropped in the chat before in our curriculum, we included a long list of Senator Elizabeth Warren's efforts on private equity, including the Stop the Wall Street looting bill that I believe Jess referenced. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, and also um, I have in my notes here the fact that, you know, we there was a hearing on private equity's role in healthcare. care. Um, and 
so yeah, can you just tell us some of the challenges on legislating and regulating and taking on this industry? Um, you know, what are those roadblocks? And also what what is this? What are these actions that, you know, lawmakers are taking and that we can take to be involved to sort of stop this actually real steal? Um, I, I can uh, I can attempt to start yeah, and, go ahead. and hopefully hopefully can finish the statement without dropping out of the call. Um, but um, I would say, you know, I think I heard something recently that for every one um, person like myself or like Alia that is lobbying for higher regulation uh, or st stricter regulations um, and other uh, forms of ways to rein in this greed, there's a thousand lobbyists on the other side um, who they have unlimited and i mean unlimited amounts of money the average person cannot fathom the the wealth that these people hold I, you know it's it's in the the billions um and so these are folks who are on the hill every single day um they're in these offices every single day um they're raising tons of money i think christian cinema um should be no surprise to anyone was one of the largest uh, recipients of private equity money um in the last election cycle you know they have just an incredible amount of reach and influence um, on in DC, you know, and that's not, I don't think a surprise to really anybody. Um, but I think beyond that, there's also just a learning curve. People don't understand it. I, I you know, I think I mentioned this before, um, in spite of, of everything, and you, maybe this isn't hard for this group to believe, legislators are just, you know, people who need to learn about the ins and outs of financial regulation like anybody else. Um, and so when we're talking about the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, for example, which um, you know, we United for Respect worked with AFR um, on with Elizabeth Warren and our leaders worked with her directly on this. Um, this is sweeping regulation that would just completely change the way um, actually most industries do business, not just private equity. And so we have enormous amounts of money and forces arrayed against us um, who every single little thing that we try to get changed, even if it's just disclosures, they are on it. They, they monitor what we do and they um, try to bury our comments, you know, but with thousands of nonsense comments, literally, they'll just be um, burying our public comment with gibberish because they don't even want to have to tell people who owns the companies that they're acquiring, you know, just small changes like that. Um, I think on the regulation front, you know, you're talking about trying to influence the White House, right? And so... Um, people are amenable. I will say the Biden administration has been very amenable to meeting with us. Obviously, the SEC um, has been, uh, you know, way more out front on this issue, I think, than any other SEC. Gary Gensler has actually called private equity out as a problem. Um, you know, maybe he hasn't used strong words like that, but he has been willing to be critical in a way that no other SEC chair has been. Um, and so you have seen things like the disclosure rule. But then you see things like the Fifth Circuit um, and uh, the same array of forces exploiting uh, an incredibly conservative court to get that rule overturned, to say this was not proper. Um, and, you know, we don't really see a very favorable pathway um, if it goes to the Supreme Court. Um, this is a court that is not um, really, you know, again, not a surprise to this group, in favor of uh, everyday people. Um, so, <laughs> so there are those pieces. Um, and then I think there's this larger overarching existential question presented by a case actually being heard by the court this term called the Loper case. Um, and I don't know if folks on this call are familiar with it. Um, and I'm not going to get too in the weeds on it. But the gist of this decision is assuming that the court rules the way that the petitioners want. Um, essentially, uh, fe federal regulation, the administrative state, um, will functionally not be able to really exist over time. Um, this is saying basically that um, the ability of these agencies to promulgate rules, the very rules we're talking about um, that rein in some of these worst abuses and practices are um, not proper. They're not properly promulgated. Um, they're not in the purview. And it, 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 I should say the court does not have to defer to their interpretation. And if they, um, you know, are litigating in a court with a conservative bench, um, they're probably not going to defer to the agency's interpretation of what they're allowed to do. Um, and so this is a pathway for, you know, every agency under the sun, the EPA, um, HHS, all of these um, 
administrative agencies um, to, to weaken them and make them ineffective com totally and completely. Um, but that certainly presents a huge challenge for us as we're trying to persuade this administration to take rather unprecedented actions when it comes to reining in um, some of these these industries. So um, I'm going to stop there and, you know, Alia, please, you know, weigh in. Yes, sorry, I was like looking at the chat and was like, let me answer some of these in the chat. But like, I think you captured a lot of it. I think there is, um, I think just one thing going back to one of the earlier questions about um, how private equity accesses um, government uh, funds and like how that can be like, you know, safeguarded against um, like, yes, it is. Wait, let me just read the question again um yes so like can you can it be carved out for better regulation like yes so i shared with you all uh, the paycheck protection program assessment i don't necessarily expect all of you to read that it's only it is 20 pages which is shorter than some of the other things i've already put in the chat um but yeah some of the things that we found is that you know it is very much about like the the language that you know and and how we are uh, how program designs, how programs are being designed and the languages, the language that's being used. Um, and, you know, so to like, certainly like that is a first step to addressing how private equity firms are, are able to like, you know, position themselves as small businesses and get access to, you know, it is sort of through loopholes and through like hastily like created funds because yeah, we were in the middle of a crisis and money needed to go out the door, um, you know, very, very rapidly. Uh, there was a second question about, can we connect the, um, how anti-PE efforts intersect with anti-monopoly and what's happening, especially at the FTC? Um, it does uh, have a connection, those two things. And I was looking for a report that we've done uh, that talks about um, certain, uh, some of the taxes, tactics that I mentioned earlier. So there are tactics like, um, it's called a roll up where private, a private equity firm will buy a bunch of small uh, companies in a related field um, and a private equity firm. And it might be KKR, but uh, I, the name is is kind of escaping me for the moment. They actually uh, bought out a bunch of air ambulance companies. And but because each, you know, company was like a relatively small one, they don't meet the threshold for like FTC review, which reviews mergers and acquisitions. And then you find that they like actually are kind of, a, you know, creating a monopoly in like these kind of niche fields. Um, and so, you know, they are also gaining market control and gaining market power through other tactics like get purchase, um, like uh, getting uh, holding minority uh, uh, shareholder rights. And um, and so there are like things like that that they are using. So the question of like anti monopoly and private equity operations are like very inter wind. And in fact, um, I'm not going to put this in the chat because it is a very long technical comment that our um, wonderful, incredibly smart uh, senior fellow Patrick Woodall uh, submitted to the FTC and uh, Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, FTC and DOJ. Uh, they had a new uh, merger guideline rules that was essentially looking at mergers uh, in the field of private equity and the role that private equity firms are playing and calling for greater disclosure um, of, of how these are playing out. Um, and, you know, uh, we do need to come up with uh, a slightly more accessible version of that very um, meaty uh, uh, comment that he made, because there's a lot of really good examples in, in that that talks about private equity firms are kind of responsible for, I think it's three quarters of uh, most recent like merger uh, reviews that need to be happening. So they are also trying to gain like monopoly power in our economy. So that is very much a tactic. It's not just through leverage buyouts. It's not just through, you know, um, you know, public money. It's also actually just creating monopolies and having market power that way and concentrating market power. Um, and so, yeah, that is another like important strategy that they are using that we have a lot of folks uh, at AFR paying very close attention to and uh, calling for new rules and new ways of, of regulating how they're able to, to operate. 
Thank you so much for taking that on. Thank you, Hollis. I see you thanking um, Ali and Jess for answering your questions. Thank you for asking questions. I am ready to turn um, to turn to audience Q and A. If folks want to drop more questions in the chat, and I have a few questions too from our Eventbrite form that folks asked, and then I have my own question, which is: I realize we have sort of been talking at a very high level about how terrible all of this is. I'm curious if either of you can speak to um, the specific ways that the impacts of private equity firms and what they're doing to the economy are impacting, you know, women, people of color, LGBTQ folks, like how, what are some of the ways we see it playing out as an extension of, you know, all of these other systems of oppression that we know we're living among? Um, you know, I'll, I'll start real quick and then Alia, I know you'll have a lot more to add, but I just want to say just real quickly in terms of the retail industry, I mean, that's primarily women and women of color who make up the retail workforce. So um, when you're talking about when private equity is coming in, taking over these, these companies, um, I should say that they've also acquired many of our fast food brands. So Yum! Brands owns a ton of the fast food companies that you see across the country. Um, that's a private equity owned uh, business. So um, a lot, there are, are millions of people working under a private equity owner. Um, and I would venture the, a guess that based on the industries, uh, most of those folks are women and women of color. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, one piece of it. But Alia, please, you know, fill in the rest. No, I mean, like, I think it's it's absolutely true. I mean, like retail being an, you know, overwhelmingly like female um you know, sector and, and workforce um, and a lot of like the workers at Toys R Us that were organized by United for Respect that I got to work with very closely, you know, women, um, mothers, grandmothers um, who felt a particular effect of, of not just losing a job in an industry, but having worked their way up as, you know, women who had to juggle childcare, who had to juggle, um, you know, raising their families. Um, there were a few Art Fan was actually an interesting example uh, that of a company that I think in the 80s and 90s was actually a good place for single moms to work. A few of the, the workers that I connected with there said that as single uh, mothers, uh, it was it, it offered flexibility uh, for them to work there. And so the loss of that, you know, uh, that job meant so much more to them because um, it had been responsible pre hybrid equity takeover of, of kind of being a source of how they've been able to like build financial stability. Um, you know, healthcare uh, is another, but on a slightly different, you know, connection um, between like how, how the industry harms people of color uh, and, you know, women and marginalized uh, identities. I mean, healthcare, you know, is also, they are buying up specialized practices. So not just nursing homes, um, but there are even like rehab facilities and um, facilities that are treating like particular um, like uh, eating disorders and, you know, those types of rehab facilities that they're buying up. Um, and so when you think about like the people who are struggling with very particular illnesses um, that are already, you know, facing a lot of like challenges through the kinds of illness that they have. Like that's also a really, really concerning um, effect of private equity's role in healthcare. Um, and then what else do I wanna say? I mean, yeah, I think that overall, if you know th this industry is, is driving wealth inequality, is sort of, you know, widening the wage gap, it is having these like ripple effects, some of which we've touched on and you know, it's ultimately not going to be good for any any of us and for certainly the communities that have, you know, been historically marginalized from building wealth. Um, the private equity industry is not invested in, you know, addressing those issues, right? One of the things that is actually really concerning, though, is that it likes to, there are narratives at play. Um, and especially when we talk about the lobbying efforts of the industry and the story it wants to tell about itself on the Hill. Um, there is a whole sort of narrative component to this that, that is worth thinking about. Um, the private equity industry is, 
you know, currently the people, the institutions that can invest in the private equity industry and private funds, as we call them, they have to be large institutions. So like, you know, you and I cannot, like individuals cannot, because I forget, actually the person who works for the uh, union pension board, I think, or retirees might know the actual threshold of what the investment has to be, but they're very high investment uh, threshold numbers. So those are typically reserved for like endowments and institutions, um, not uh, individuals. So there had been some call for like opening up the private equity industry to what they call retail investors, meaning, you know, regular individual investors that want to trade in stocks and, you know, bonds and stuff like that. Um, because uh, they talked about uh, the industry would say that, you know, we are building, we have the ability to build the wealth of uh, marginalized communities. We are a wealth builder. And um, marginalized communities that have not been able, that have been held back from building their wealth could, they should have access to investing in the private equity industry uh, and private funds. And uh, that's a very scary thing to hear, you know, and it's uh, certainly a line that we've heard uh, both Democrats and Republicans on the Hill sort of asking about, but isn't it a wealth builder? Isn't there, isn't it a great opportunity? Isn't the potential? Um, to you know, actually use private equity for good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would just say, no, that's not their interest. They're not you know, interested in, in building um, wealth for black and brown communities, for women and LGBTQ communities. I'll, they are driving, they are again, yeah, driving all of the major, you know, trends that we see in uh, wealth inequality and economic inequality overall, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you know, that was actually, um, that touched too on a question someone had asked in Eventbrite about whether or not there was potential there. So I'm glad that you sort of got us there too. Um, I wanna ask this question. I'm getting a lot of questions that make me think of the meme with the woman and the math swirling around her face and she can't make sense of any of it. Um, and so I wanna address Stacy's question, which is definitely just sort of this clarity point of, you know, are, if, if these companies are coming in, if these private equity firms are coming in and gutting these companies and laying people off, is, is it true that these companies were sort of headed for gutting themselves for money anyway? Were they going to be put in a position to lay off their employees? And if not, basically make it make sense. How can legislators praise local economies if private equity is coming into their communities and, you know, destroying the local economy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question because, I mean, that was when I first started organizing the, the media coverage of uh, Toys R Us shifted um, from, you know, how before we were organizing to after. Uh, before organizing, the coverage was all about like Toys R Us had a debt problem already uh, and it is uncompetitive uh, with um, e-commerce. So with the rise of Amazon, uh, with the rise of like, you know, Walmart also getting into toys and, you know, lower cost alternatives. Uh, Toys R Us was uncompetitive to begin with. Um, and once we really focused all of our analysis and the campaign on the shadowy private equity owners of the company that were actually dumping debt into the and, and driving the bankruptcy, then we started to see that legislators were paying attention. Then we got a lot of support, you know, that sort of led up to the introduction of the Stop Wall Street Looting Act. But we did, you know, um, a rally and protest in in New Jersey in June of 2018, and we got a bunch of, you know, state um, state legislators, and you know, Cory Booker came out, and you know, so when when you make the connection, uh, then the members, you know, then the legislators are going to be perking up and listening and being concerned and being like, oh, this does affect the local economy. This is this is a bit of an issue. And it does sometimes go against maybe the stories and the lines that they they have been told. Not always. There are a lot of, um, you know, we've lobbied many legislators. Uh, <laughs> Jess has mentioned some of them who we are not going to be bringing over to our side anytime soon. And, you know, they're on the side, you know, they are other Democrats, they have long a long standing history with uh, the private equity industry. So even if you point out some of the data and some of the you know effects on the local economy, they're not going to be um, moved by by that. Um, 
but others are. And I would say that, you know, with things like hospital closures, like that's a really big deal. Um, I remember in 2018, 2019, uh, in Philadelphia, there was a hospital, a Hahnemann hospital closed. And um, that was also like a, a point, you know, of a lot of media coverage. I mean, it's always a big deal if a hospital closes, obviously, right? Access to healthcare um, is a very big deal. And so then you will start to see uh, legislators paying attention and, you know, um, and, and we've seen that even with more, more recent ones as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's always a way to kind of talk about, uh, there are two recent hospital closures, uh, Stewart Healthcare, which is a for-profit uh, company that was owned by Cerberus, which we've brought up a couple of times. They were involved in the Albertsons Kroger merger. Um, and, uh, you know, they are, are based in Massachusetts. So um, Senator Elizabeth Warren is is paying particular attention to that. Um, and then there was a hospital closure in Rhode Island as well. Um, and I can put some links in the chat in a moment. But, uh, you know, so whenever there are these like localized like bankruptcies and closures, then you do see, you know, um, legislators wanting to do inquiries, wanting to ask questions. Yeah, I'll just add to that one a couple things. One, Hahnemann Hospital, um, as to the earlier question about how does this impact marginalized communities, was a major service center um, in an inner city part of of Philadelphia. This was a primarily um, black and brown community that was being served by this hospital. Um, and when it was shut down, it was shut down to create luxury, luxury condos. Um, so I just wanted to underscore that point. Um, yeah. Um, uh, the other uh, piece of this, I would say, um, you know, we actually found a champion for our, um, we, we've sort of at the state level, because there's not, um, we have to sort of do more research into the ways that we can rein in private equity using state regulations. Um, one of the things that we've done as United for Respect is um, roll out these things called guaranteed severance pay bills. Um, so when a company goes bankrupt, they have to pay a week of severance pay for every year that someone worked at the company. Um, we've passed this in New Jersey. Um, it is the law of the land in New Jersey as of 2023. Um, and over a thousand people were able to take advantage of that um, in the wake of the Bed Bath & Beyond bankruptcy. Um, but I should say in New York, um, Shelley Mayer, who's a Senator, um, I believe in, uh, why am I why am I blanking on the name of the upper suburb right outside Manhattan? I took the bar exam there. Um that the senator that represents um that Westchester, there we go, came to me. Um there was actually a resort that was bought up by private equity um in her district that closed. Um, and she didn't know, right? I think, again, we have to underscore, these people just don't know. Um, as Alia said, you have to draw that connection for them. They, they don't understand that that's what's happening. Um, and she took up this bill. She's the champion of this bill in New York. Um, and then I really quickly wanted to touch here in Michigan. Um, I mean, our van closing was a huge deal. Um, people were outraged. Local politicians were outraged. Um, and again, you know, we had the, what I will say about that business specifically, um, because there was a question about were they already going, you know, down the tubes. Art Van was profitable. Art Van uh, was actually doing better um, than e-commerce, comparable e-commerce companies at the time. Um, and they made up lies about the um, health of the business. But when you looked at the books, the company was was doing extremely well. Um, and uh, THL um, pushed them out of business, right? They, they degraded um, their... Uh, uh, they degraded their business model to the point that they went bankrupt. So it is not always the case that they're taking over dying companies. I would say PetSmart is another example of that. They took over PetSmart um, and, they, and you know, they're still owned by a private equity owner. Um, yes. And so um, they actually got really lucky with that buy because um, PetSmart went gangbusters in the pandemic, right? Everyone got a dog. Everyone got a pet in the pandemic. So um, there, it's actually an incredibly profitable bus business to be in right now, but that doesn't mean that they're not degrading the working conditions for these workers. Um, and I should say again, you know, we were organizing folks at PetSmart for a while, trying to push back and um, change their working conditions. And the vast majority of the folks that we were organizing were trans young folks. Um, so these are people, these are the folks that are, are being affected on the front line. Um, and just because the business is profitable does not mean the workers are being treated well. So um, I just wanted to add those points. Thank you so much. And I know we're closing in on time. So I've seen there's a couple of questions that I've seen um, 
coming in through Eventbrite and coming in through the chat about sort of where do we go from here and how can we make a difference and what is keeping you all hopeful? And there's also this question that came in sort of asking, is there a world where equality isn't extractive? Is there a way we can get other people's money involved in building business where it can be additive for all, including the environment? And I would add to that, including the larger community. And so I'm I'm curious for you, I'm going to roll it all up into one for the two of you, which is, you know, what is the future beyond this ic- ic- hyper extractive form of capitalism and piracy that we see not just in private equity, but in so many different ways, right, in our lives? This theme that there's a lot of people out there trying to take as much as they can out without putting anything back in for anyone. Um, so I'm curious, like, what is your vision for an economy that's not built on that kind of extraction and exploitation? Um, and what can all of us do uh, to help you get there? What are the things that you're hopeful will get us there? Well, I guess I can start. I'm a socialist. So that is my vision for a better world. I'll just put <laughs> it out there, right? Um, we, I believe that the economy can be a built to work uh, for all of us, collectively owned for collective benefit, right? Um, that is possible. And um, now it's not necessarily on the horizon. It may be the next 10 years. I would love to believe that. <laughs> Um, but you know there are there are models of economies and economic structure, structures that are not extractive and don't have to be. Um, so you know, ab- absent uh, moving to full socialism, I would say you know there are um, efforts that I've mentioned that um, Ali has mentioned to rein in the the greed that does exist. Um, I think you know that is a first step, sort of changing the way making it so it's not profitable anymore for these companies to do these things, making it illegal for them to do things that are currently legal, which is mind boggling, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the things that they do, it literally feels like they are stealing money from people and it's legal, right? So I think those are first steps. I think raising people's expectations um, is incredibly important um, in that, you know, I think people have a, have a pretty good idea that things are really bad. Um, but I think having those conversations about what things can look like, um, not just why it's so bad, but you know how we can fix it, how we can move forward. Um, I think those are incredibly important conversations to have. So, um, you know, sorry I had to go out there with the with the big vision. <laughs> I would be I would be remiss as a member of DSA not to say that. Um, but, <laughs> but Never think, apologize. Yeah. But getting involved, um, being part of this political education, like talking to your neighbors, your friends, your family about what's happening. And, you know, for those that are interested in doing lobbying or getting involved in political activity, um, putting the pressure on your elected officials to pass these regulations and do right by us. So now that I just threw that gauntlet out there, I'll <laughs> <laughs> I know how to follow. I mean, you know, I would say that some of what it, it's hard to sit and listen to us talk for this long and, and detail all of this um, destruction and pillaging and, and awfulness that's happening and, and then wonder like what is possible. But I mean, I should say that we what Jess and I are doing with the Private Equity Coalition, I think, has made me feel more hopeful because there are a lot of groups on the ground that are fighting private equity uh, owners in um, all of the industries that we mentioned, and they're winning, and they are changing the conversation, and they are, you know, uh, Unite Here Local 11, which represents hospitality workers in uh, Southern California and Nevada as well, um, you know, they have contracts with a ton of private equity owned small uh, boutique hotels. And they created so much uh, pressure uh, for one of the private equity firms. They essentially were able to get them to leave the industry and agree to not acquire any more uh, hotels. You know, it is possible to win. Winning is possible. With Toys R Us, we won. You know, um, with Toys R Us, we won $20 million for laid off Toys R Us workers when there was no legal precedent for it. And that demand was made from day one directly of the private equity firms. And then we replicated it on a smaller scale because with Artvan, but Artvan was again, you know, it was a small regional, smaller regional company, but um, Artvan workers got a $2 million fund. And I forget how many workers there were uh, at Artvan, but, um, you know, uh, for Toys R Us, 33,000 workers, you know, winning, winning a $20 million fund. That's, that's materially significant. As an organizer, as a campaigner, your job is to think about what are the materially significant gains that we can 
you know, actually achieve. And we've done it. And there are so many other people that have also done things, um, winning materially, you know, um, tenant advocates uh, like Inquilinos Unidos who organize up in um, Minnesota, in Minneapolis. Um, you know, they've won, you know, everything from like rent abatements, they've gotten repairs fixed, they've gotten, you know, they have dealt with all of the issues that their members wanted fixed, they've gotten them relocated to, you know, better housing as well, you know, I mean, people are winning. Um, and so I think that part of what's happening is that a lot of people are fighting their fights uh, locally, they're fighting their fights in their, you know, specific sector that they're organizing. Um, but there is a tremendous amount of things to be hopeful for. Um, because, you know, yeah, there are a lot of wins that are happening. They're just not necessarily all coming together as one cohesive whole. That is one of the things that we're trying to do with our private equity coalition. Um, and yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, and then of course, yeah, there, there is a lot of interest, uh, on the Hill as well, you know, with the investigations into private equities, uh, takeover of, of hospitals and, you know, um, so like, there are like uh, there are people, you know, um, that members of Congress that are calling for investigations, members of Congress that were already involved. I mean, obviously, Elizabeth Warren um, introducing the Stop All Street Looting Act, um, the SEC's private fund rules, which were a little wonky, but incredibly important um, and, you know, really produced quite a bit of pressure for the industry. So th there is a lot happening on the regulatory front, on the legislative front. Um, and on the campaigning and organizing front. And, and, you know, I think it is possible to win. I think sometimes, in fact, why they keep moving from sector to sector may also be because they start to get a lot of, you know, pressure in one, you know, so, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you both for those inspiring and hopeful responses. Um, I did see Mary Beth pointed out in the chat too that monetary reform can be very connected to the fight for a better economy. We did have a question that we unfortunately didn't have time to get around to about those connections, but I just wanted to drop in the chat that we had. Um, we did have a conversation on monetary reform and you know some of the um, new forms of money that that we're seeing crypto and all that fun stuff um, and the big bubble that's about to burst there. So I'm just dropping the link to that recording. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Ali and Jess. Thank you for everyone who is here today. Thank you to the AEOO team who put this together. Um, and let's just uh, some applause for our guests. I Everyone had so many questions. I loved how engaged everyone was. So I can tell that this was in a conversation that hit home for a lot of folks. Um, and oh, thank you, Alia, for dropping your info in there too, because I know some people were asking about how to learn more about the coalition. So everyone just simply reach out to Alia and Jess. Um, they'll, know, they'll know where you were if you were here on Monday night. Um, and Ryan, if you want to pull up that final slide, make sure for you all too, um, we will share a recording of this talk. It'll get emailed out to everyone who RSVP'd and it'll be up on our website. Um, and there's obviously tons of other good stuff on the website to, to watch, to check out. Um, and of course, let's stay in touch. So please... Um, go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, read our blog on Medium and subscribe to it, do all of the things. Um, and if you can, please consider joining our giving circle and supporting Empowering Women's Economic Voices with a monthly or one-time donation. And again, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you one last time, Alia and Jess. It was truly amazing. And so I've learned so much today. I've gone from a zero to maybe a humble four. Um, I, and I am driven to learn more. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. And thank you everyone for being here and we'll see you soon.